Uh, good evening, beloved. It's a uh, pleasure to be here in the house of the Lord with you as we uh, bookend our Lord's Day in worship, uh, as we commit ourselves to the worship of God on the full day of the Sabbath day. Uh, we know that it's for our edification, for our good, for our sanctification, even as the Lord promises us by His Word that He is conforming us more into the image of His Son uh, for His glory. Um, I do want to highlight just a few announcements that we covered this morning, but I want to remind you of them. One that's not in your bulletin that I want you to pay attention to is uh, that the DCS auction is this Thursday night. Uh, so Dillon Christian School's uh, auction is this Thursday night. Please come out and support uh, our school's um, fundraiser event, uh, and, and we would be uh, much appreciative of your attendance and your participation uh, as we continue to, to raise funds uh, for our new expansion. Also, uh, please be preparing your hearts for uh, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper that we'll observe next Sunday morning. Um, and so this will be the, uh, the first, Lord willing, the first uh, communion service for our communicants. Um, and so they'll be coming before the session uh, next Sunday morning uh, at 1045 in between Sunday school and worship. And then they'll be partaking of the Lord's Supper with us. We're really excited about that. Also, um, the Easter season is approaching very quickly. Um, and we have a full schedule of, of fellowship opportunities and uh, worship services. And so if you'll uh, pay attention to those uh, posters around the church and the educational wing, uh, you'll be able to mark your calendars accordingly uh, for all those services and fellowship opportunities that we have. So we thank you for your participation in the life of the church. But for now, let us prepare our hearts for worship. Our call to worship tonight comes from Psalm 95. Uh, here now is, as God calls us into his presence to worship him uh, through his word. O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. Our God in heaven, uh, we are your people by grace, Lord, you have made us a people uh, for your own possession. Through Christ, Lord, we are grateful that you have brought us back to yourself, that you have made us sons and daughters. Uh, Lord, you are a creator, but uh, you sent your son to come and die for us and that we might be adopted as children, uh, given your spirit by whom or through whom we cry out, Abba, Father, and it's to you that we come, and it's to you that we wish to worship this evening, Lord. We pray that you would be with us during this time. Lord, we know that we can do nothing apart from you. We pray you would bless this time that we can worship in spirit and in truth. Uh, we bring this all in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Well, if you all would uh, take your hymnals and turn to hymn number 175, uh, let us begin by singing this him together, a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. Again, it is hymn number 175. Uh, please stand and let's sing together as uh, we're able to do so.
I guess verse 3 was so good, we, I, I decided to do it twice. I didn't know what was going on. I thought Matt lost his place, but <laughs> that's all right. All right, well, let's move uh, ahead to our corporate confession of faith, and very fitting as we begin our series tonight on the Apostles' Creed. Um, again, truths taken from the Scripture. Uh, this is not Scripture. This is not infallible. But it is indeed what the church has believed that the Bible teaches, condensed to about a paragraph about our triune God. Um, and uh, we profess in an increasingly hostile word, world that we believe these things to be true because the Bible teaches them. So um, I will uh, start us off and, and we'll get into confessing what we believe together. So Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, if you'd take your hymnal uh, again and turn to number 307, uh, please remain standing for this uh, hymn of preparation. Let us sing together, Nothing But the Blood of Jesus, hymn number 307.
seated. Let us uh, go to our God together in prayer. <clears throat> our Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you tonight, Lord, and uh, we do come to you through the blood of Jesus. Um, Lord, no man, no human being can approach you, um, Lord, without an intercessor, without one who is worthy, and your word is uh, explicit that there, there is a mediator. Uh, there is one mediator, one intercessor, Lord, between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Lord, we come to you through him. Um, we come to him who is seated at your right hand. Lord Jesus, we come uh, through you, uh, who were born of a virgin, who did live a sinless life, who did die a, a sacrificial, substitutionary, atoning death on the cross, who was raised, Lord, and who is alive and ascended and seated at the right hand of our Father, and who is, who are, Lord, coming back, who, um, who is God in the flesh, Lord. We come through you, uh, Father, we come not trusting in our own words, or, um, and Lord, not in our own righteousness. And Lord, we do know that if we do regard sin and iniquity in our hearts, that you will not hear us. Uh, so, Lord, as we do know that, we pray for all of us that you would help us uh, to deal with sins in our heart, Lord, if it's um, anything. Uh, Lord, we are still sinners. You began a good work in us, and we are grateful and pray that you'll be faithful to your word to continue that good work in us, that you won't let us go. Lord, we can count on the fact that we will stray, uh, but we can count on the fact that you'll be faithful to uh, watch over us, that Christ loses nothing, that is your will, uh, that of all that you have given to him, he loses nothing but raises it up on the last day. So we come with that assurance, Lord, thankful that we have a, a good father who deals with us as a, a, as a gracious father, who does correct us, who loves us, uh, and who does not leave us. Father, we come um, thankful for the many blessings you've given us, this church, uh, Lord, we're thankful for this church. I'm thankful for the less than two years I've been here, uh, but for this church and its over 120 years of existence, Lord, and uh, in the desire still of a church in, in Main Street uh, that is still a, a conservative, Bible-believing church. Lord, we're thankful for that. I'm thankful for that, uh, that there's still a church here, that, that uh, here, a Presbyterian church in in uh, the middle of Dillon that wants to preach the gospel. And I know as you go to most cities, the churches that have been around for a long time, that is usually not the case. So we praise you for your faithfulness, Lord. Uh, we pray that you'd continue to be with the session here, uh, to be faithful to what the Bible teaches. Um, Lord, uh, we're thankful that we're able to meet and to even go through this series starting tonight about really the basics of of the faith, of what we believe the Bible teaches about you, the truth, about reality. Father, we do lift up our brothers and sisters in places where they can't do what we're doing right now. We do, of course, think of our brothers and sisters in the Ukraine, and as our own denomination has 13 churches there in the Ukraine, Lord, that's extremely encouraging. I know of other uh, Baptist brethren as well, that there are many uh, churches in the Ukraine, and uh, we lift them up, Lord, and pray for strength for uh, them as they uh, continue to live in a, a dangerous and scary uh, time and situation. Uh, would you give them grace, Lord? Would you let them know that they are being prayed for, Lord? Would you strengthen their hearts in you? Uh, Father, we do pray for our brothers and sisters in, in areas where they're uh, persecuted uh, by the government or they're persecuted by uh, militias in their country, or Lord, as they're persecuted by even people in their own family. Uh, Lord, we pray for our, our brethren, uh, your children scattered abroad, Lord, that you would keep them, uh, that you would keep their hearts, Lord, that you would strengthen them for uh, this life. Heavenly Father, as we, on this first day of spring, we are reminded that you have put the seasons in place as you uh, spoke after the flood that seed time and harvest, Lord, that there's, uh, you've put times and seasons in place for us. And as we do come to the springtime, Lord, already uh, many of us look ahead to the end of the school year and, and realize that we're coming down the home 
stretch now, and Father, we do want to pray for uh, the parents and our students as they go to school, and uh, we want to pray for our, our uh, church members who uh, have kids in public school and um, our public school teachers and workers, and just, Lord, pray for um, endurance for them. Pray that you would help them to remember, Lord, that as they go to work, uh, they work first and foremost, as we all do, Lord, for you, that we are to do everything we do uh, to your glory and honor. Would you give them grace? Would you help them to uh, be light where they are? Uh, would you encourage them and strengthen them? Lord, we do uh, pray for our homeschooling parents that you would give them grace and endurance and wisdom uh, as they teach their children and bring them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord and uh, as they navigate uh, these times that we're in as well. And Lord, we do, of course, pray for Dillon Christian School as well. Um, we do pray uh, for continued grace and, and uh, Lord, the, the grace to, um, to be a, a Christian school, Lord, as you've kept this church faithful. We pray that you would help uh, us to be faithful at the school, that you'd help us to be a good witness, um, that you'd continue your work, Lord. We just ask for your grace. Uh, Heavenly Father, we do want to pray for those who are sick in our congregation and those who are suffering. Um, Lord, we do thank you again for Miss Sally as she's got to come home, and we pray you'd be with her. I know she said this morning that she's going back down to Charleston for some things, and just pray that you'd be with her and uh, that she'd be representative of all those who are dealing with um, issues, Lord, and um, those, whether they be uh, in our body, Lord, or in our, our minds. And Father, we thank you that ultimately uh, we know our bodies will waste away, uh, that as a result of sin, we will die. Uh, that is the, the fruit of sin, Lord, uh, ultimately. Uh, but we do thank you that in Christ uh, we need not fear the grave. Uh, Christ Jesus conquered the grave and death, that all things are ours, Lord, as your word says, and that even includes death is ours. Um, it ushers the believer into your immediate presence, and our bodies will be raised, and they will be uh, perfect and never able to perish. So, Lord, will we live with that hope and not because it's a vain hope? It is the truth. It is what will happen. So would we live with that confidence, Lord, as surely as Jesus is risen from the grave, so also will we be uh, who are united to him by faith. Lord, we pray that you'd be with Pastor Matt now. Would you speak through him? Would you encourage our hearts? Lord, would you grant your grace to a, a weary and needy people that needs you? Now we ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks, Pastor Don. If you'll take out your copies of God's Word and let's open up to Romans chapter 10, Romans chapter 10, we're going to, of course, be looking at the Apostles' Creed with a series that uh, we're going to entitle, Don't Stop Believing, um, and we use that phrase not because of the Journey Rock song, even though I love Journey, um, but because uh, in a postmodern world, dare I say a post-Christian world, uh, we need a foundation of the gospel to stand upon and to believe in. Um, and I think that uh, one of the greatest things that we can use, one of the best tools that we can use uh, to keep the essentials essential as we, as we pilgrim through a, a sin-broken land with our brothers and sisters in Christ is uh, the Apostles' Creed. And so as we study the Apostles' Creed, we're going to be looking at different texts throughout God's Word. Uh, and tonight we're going to come from Romans 10 verses 8 through 10. Romans chapter 10, verses 8 through 10. In this uh, post-Christian world, I think that we could probably say that as a world in totality. Um, I would probably argue that we could say that about our nation as well, but I know that some of y'all aren't quite ready to say that yet. Um, but nonetheless, in a, in a post-modern society... Uh, there, there are many debates, many discussions on what is true. And at the end of the day, in this post-modern culture, this post-Christian world that we live in, uh, we, we have to say, or we're told to say, that truth is what you make it. Uh, that there is no absolute truth. 
that if there is essentials regarding the truth, there would be defi different definitions of what those essentials might be. And as Christians, we have to be prepared to tackle that mindset. You know, this past week we saw something that we held on to truth since the very beginning seemingly be told to us by the news media that it is now untrue. And if you know anything of what I'm talking about, you know that in the current events, this young man who went to Penn University, ranked about 486th uh, in the nation in swimming, decided that he was going to identify himself as a woman, uh, and now he's ranked first in the nation uh, in swimming. Newsflash, men swim faster than women. Who would have thought? Um, I, you know, it's one of those things that we all knew. And we knew that a man was a man and a woman was a woman. And now our culture has told us that that might not just be true. And why is it not true? Because that young man says it's not true or he believes it's not true or identifies that it's not true. And in, a, in this post-Christian, this post-modern world, we have to ask ourselves the question, what is true? And our Bibles tell us what is true. And our Bibles tell us what's essential in the Christian faith. And our Bibles tell us what we ought to believe concerning God. And how we are to love this God. And how we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. Everything that we have to do in this life, every, every jot and tittle of it tells us how we are to glorify God. How that is true. And in this post-Christian world, in this post-modern world, in this postmodern society, oftentimes, now I believe that Presbyterians are, are the best, don't misunderstand what I'm saying here, uh, and, and we are going to get the closest mansions to Jesus in heaven because, you know, we were elect um, and chosen, but nonetheless, there are going to be times where we have to lock arm in arm together with saints outside of the Presbyterian reform circles, and we have to know what is true. What is essential? Our Westminster Confession of Faith tells us that oftentimes the visible church looks more or less visible. And of course, I think the Westminster Confession uh, is describing here this idea of the true marks of the church, the preaching of the word, the, the prayers of the people, and the sacraments being uh, rightly administered. Those ordinary means of grace that we talk about so often uh, are they more visible or less visible within the local visible church? But also I think the Westminster Confession of Faith's understanding that there will be times where we have to lock arm in arm together with the visible church. And how are we to know who is the visible church? Are they more or less visible? Are they adhering to uh, the essentials of the faith as described for us in the Apostles' Creed? We recited the Apostles' Creed this evening. We've recited it hundreds if not thousands of times as a church throughout our uh, 100 plus years of existence. And we know uh, that, that the Apostles' Creed is a, a, as Pastor Don said, the essentials of the gospel written to us in paragraph form so that we might have a declaration, a confession of faith that gives weight to our faith, our life, and our church. That it gives us something of what we are to believe. It gives us an understanding, I guess you could say, of what we are to believe. It gives you a clarity, that more or less visible language, a clarity of what the church ought to believe and what the church ought to proclaim and what the church ought to stand for. And it focuses our fellowship, not only as Presbyterians, but as Presbyterians and Baptists and Methodists and all the evangelical world, what we are to believe concerning the gospel, both locally and universally. One of, the, one of the greatest things I ever heard when I was at Clemson, other than the word preached, y'all mostly know my testimony, how I fell in love with the word preached first in my journey to the Reformed faith. But I remember uh, Dr. David Sinclair beginning the Apostles' Creed, of course with Christian, what do you believe? But he reminded us that this had been something that has been declared, confessed from, or for generations all over the world on the Lord's Day. And it, and, it, and it helps us to understand that this 
universal church has the foundation of the gospel, the essentials of the gospel that we might stand upon so that we might know what is orthodox or true. And of course, like Pastor Don said, the Apostles' Creed reflects the Scriptures. Never would we stand in the pulpit and do a series, a sermon series, on something that did not come straight from the Scriptures. And so it reflects the Scriptures. And I heard one pastor explain it this way. He said it's much like how the moon reflects the sun. And I had to think about that for a second. It's been a long time since I had a science class. And I had to think about that for a minute. The moon reflects the sun. All the, all the light that the moon gives off is just a reflection of the light that the sun gives. And, it, and it's, this remarkable, it's this remarkable illustration of how the scripture shines a light so brightly that, that our confessions, our orthodox confessions, reflect that light onto what we believe. And I think the Apostles' Creed does all this. And the Apostles' Creed helps us stand upon the scriptures which teach us, as we are going to see here in our first lesson, that we believe in God. We believe in God. So Romans chapter 10, verses 8 through 10, let's read it together. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth. That is part of the confession, is it not? In your mouth and in your heart. That's the most important part of the confession. That is the word of faith that we proclaim, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God for it. What do we mean when we confess that we believe in God? Now, admittedly, I think that we've all been in a place where we have done an individual Bible study during our quiet times in the Apostles' Creed, or maybe we've sat through a Sunday school class or taught a Sunday school class on the Apostles' Creed. I had the opportunity to teach through the Apostles' Creed many years ago now uh, when I was doing youth group, and I was looking for kind of these examples, if you will, of people who said they believed in God but got it totally wrong. And through my, you know, kind of meandering through uh, YouTube videos and and different research models and things like that, I came across this video that that went viral probably about 12, 13 years ago, uh, where this this Christian organization was was going about this big city, I think it might have been Chicago, uh, and they came across this this young woman named Sheila Larson. And, And they began to ask Sheila some very religious questions. Questions about the Christian faith. And they asked her, Sheila, do you believe in God? And Sheila goes, of course I believe in God. And they said, well, explain your belief, your faith in God. And she goes, well, I wouldn't consider myself, I think her quote was, a religious fanatic. And I can't even remember the last time I went to church, but my faith has carried me a long way. And kind of dumbfounded, the the interviewer said to the interviewee, well, you know, could you explain what religion you, you identify with, I guess you can say, that helps you believe in God? And she kind of thought on that for a minute. And, you know, I, I was thinking that she was going to probably come up with Christianity and it was going to be nominal at best. Uh, but she said that I guess you can call it Sheilaism. And I thought, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. So, of course, I, I, I saved that video and I showed it at youth group. And, but, but she explained it. She says, you know, I think God speaks to me through this small little voice in my head. And it tells me that I should love myself and, and love one another, love my neighbor. And, you know, I guess that's what God would want me to do. To take care of myself and take care of one another. And, it, and if we were to poll... In this room, if she really knew who God was, we would probably say, we're the faithful remnant of First Pres, right? We would probably say no. But you would be surprised at the number of kids that I had in the youth group here that said, well, you know, that's something, Jesus said something like that. I guess you can say that she believes in God. 
But is that what we're confessing when we confess the Apostles' Creed together? Are we saying alongside of Sheila that God is some, some sort of moral teacher that impacts the way that we take care of ourselves and each other? Are we confessing that we believe in a deity alongside of the Hindus, Mormons, Muslims, or any other religion? Are we just saying that we're not atheists? Are we confessing that God is an option amongst other gods? You know, it was not that long ago when, um, when the National Order of Evangelicals, is that right? Association of Evangelical, or yeah, something like that. The National Association of Evangelicals, there it is. The NAE put out a joint statement. The NAE is uh, a, a political arm represented by, or they represent many different, what we would call evangelical uh, denominations, sadly even uh, our denomination. And they put out this joint statement that alongside of the Muslim Brotherhood that said, you know, at the end of the day, our God and their God are the same exact God. Is that what we're confessing? Is that what we're confessing when we use the Apostles' Creed and say simply that we believe in God? Or are we declaring that we believe in the God who is revealed to us in God's Word? If, if you were uh, in our First Presbyterian 101 class, you, you heard me say over and over and over again that we are a church that is guided by the Word, that we're going to preach the Word, we're going to pray the Word, we're going to worship according to the Word, we're going to practice the sacraments as described or, or, or given to us in the Word. Everything that we do ought to be driven by the Word. Well, our confessing of who God is must be driven by the Word as well. And as we say that we believe in God, as we confess that we believe in God, I think that our confession of who God is must contain a knowledge of God as He is revealed to us in the Scripture. If we are to believe in our heart that there is a God, and if we are to confess it with our mouth, as the Apostle Paul says here in Romans chapter 10, we must understand that the truth of who God is is revealed to us in the Scriptures. You know, one of the one of the misunderstandings, I think, of the church today in, in the United States of America is that we see the, the great divide as those who are atheists and those who are theists. Those who don't believe in God and those who believe in God. And, and yet, I, I, I don't think that that is what the great divide is. I think the great divide is those who say there is a God, like Sheila, and those who confess the God of the Bible. You know, it's, it's one of those things that we, that we experience so often. I know that it was kind of mind-blowing to some of the youth years ago, my first couple of years doing ministry here at First Pres, that, that we went to Cherokee, and one of the first things that, that Mike, the, the director of the Cherokee Mission, said was that when you go... Door-to-door -door evangelism. That's what we did on Tuesdays and Thursday nights. Really got the kids out of their comfort zone. When we began knocking on doors and asking people if they believed in God, he said the first answer you're going to get from every door you knock on is going to be yes. Yes, I believe in God. But Mike told us you've got to press on that a little bit. Because they're going to say that God is the creator. That God spoke things into existence. And that... Is true, is it not? And yet, they are going to stop there. They're not going to allow the Bible from the rest of Genesis 3 through the end of Revelation speak to who God is. And that's the great divide, is it not? Would we consider someone, uh, would we consider someone confessing that there is a God and only saying that He is Creator? Of course we wouldn't. And that is the great divide that exists with even in the Christian world today. That we say we believe in God and yet we do not let the Bible tell us who God is. We think that because we say that we believe in a quote unquote higher power and we just happen to call Him God, that we're right on track. 
And, and yet, Jesus tells us in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Why is that so? Because God has told us that there will be those who confess Him and yet do not know Him. I think it's exactly what we see with, with people like Sheila, with people like many of the Cherokee Indians, with people like our brothers and sisters or our children or our neighbors. They, they say or they think that just by simply saying that they believe in God, that they have somehow secured their way to heaven. And, and the sad part is that if you ask them who God is, they would have no better of a working definition than Sheila and say, well, I guess it's Sheilaism. You know, in that same train of thought, it's one of the commentators that I was uh, reading this past week. He says that um, on the sixth day of creation, God created man in his image. And sadly today, man has returned the favor by trying to create a God in his image. And that is so true, isn't it? But we have to understand that faith in any other God that's not the God revealed in the Bible is idolatry and it will never save. You see, there's a difference, isn't there? Romans chapter 10 tells us so clearly there's a difference there in, in just simply saying it with your mouth and letting the gospel truths of a God proclaimed to us in the, in the Bible to change our hearts and to live within our hearts. Well, if the essence of idolatry is an attempt to God, make God more manageable, it seems, how has God revealed Himself in the Bible? And I think we can just simply go to Exodus chapter 3 with, with Moses at the burning bush, and we begin our kind of journey there, because it's there where God tells us what His name is, isn't it? As Moses is, is tending his... Uh, father-in-law's sheep, as he's there at, at, you know, at, at Mount Horeb, literally the mountain of God, he sees the, the bush on fire and yet it's not consumed. And out of curiosity, much like me and you would do, we begin to walk over, or he begins to walk over to this burning bush and he hears God speak through the flames and he hears his name, Moses. Stop right there, don't come any closer, Take your shoes off. This is holy ground. And as Moses takes off his shoes and he begins to approach, approach the bush, he hears the Lord say, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And immediately Moses begins to hide his face for he knows that he's undone in the very presence of the Lord. And the Lord continues to say, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt and I have heard their crying out because of their oppression and I am concerned over their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and take them to a, a good and, and, and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Of course, he's talking about the promised land. And then he says, and Moses, I'm going to send you. And we all know the response of Moses, don't we? Me? <laughs> Lord, you're talking about me? No. I, you know, I have, a, I have a, a speech impediment. You can't be talking about me. No, I'm going to be with you. Well, why are the Israelites, why is Pharaoh going to listen to me? Well, you tell them that the God of their fathers sent me. The God of their fathers has desired to rescue them. The God of their fathers has heard them. Tell them that Yahweh has sent you. You remember? And it's this declaration of, of His own name. Say to them, the Lord has sent you. This is my name forever. And I will be remembered in this way from generation to generation, He says. That's the personal name of God. And so the National Association of Evangelicals gets it so wrong. Our God's name is not Allah. Our God's name is Yahweh. Our God's name is not Baal. Our God's name is not Asherah. Our not, God's name is not those irreverent names that we use like the, the great architect of the universe or the big man upstairs. No, He's the Lord. And that's how we ought to know Him as. That's what we are to know Him as. He is the Lord. 
He is who He is. Our existence is, is totally dependent on Him, not the other way around. For in Him we live and move and we have our being. And He is faithful to His covenants. He is faithful to His promises. And in giving us His name, the name of Yahweh, He, he tells us, I am the God who has remembered my promises of old. That's why God, the Lord, Yahweh, tells Moses, you tell them that the God, their father of Jacob and Israel and Abraham sent them. Why is he, why is he using those specific patriarchs of the faith? Because God has promised to be their God and them his people throughout all of Scripture. And he says, I am this one who has sworn by my name and there's nothing greater to swear upon. And I'm going to keep my promises and I'm going to teach you who I am and we are going to be one, united forever. And you know, this is all what we call the special revelation of God. And I know we get a little tense when we begin to think about these theological terms like the special revelation of God but it's so simple, even the children, can, the children can grasp this, that God has especially and supernaturally revealed Himself to us in His Word. How can a child grasp such a thing? Well, you ask them to sing, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Well, how do you know Jesus loves you? The Bible tells me so. The Bible tells us exactly who God is. He reveals to us who God is. When we confess with our mouth who God is, we are confessing with our heart and with our voice that God is who He has revealed Himself to be in His Bible, in His Word. And we have to acknowledge that. We have to acknowledge that. You know, it it can't just be some mere intellectual knowledge of God. But we have to intimately and personally and faithfully know God. One of the most convicting texts in all of the Bible, I think, is James chapter 2, verse 19, where it says that you believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe and shudder. They shudder because their belief is not an intimate, personal, saving faith. It's merely an intellectual faith. And so when we confess that that there is a God, that we believe in God. We are not confessing some strange deity outside of us, but we are confessing a God that is ours. A God that is ours. I know I've used this before, but there's a difference between knowing of God and knowing God. We've all had those conversations with friends, haven't we, where they'll ask you, well, don't you know so-and-so? And And you go, well, I kind of know of them. Meaning you have no personal relationship with them. Meaning that there's just some sort of kind of abstract person out in society somewhere. You might have some acquaintances together, but you do not know him. You do not know her. You just know of them. In our confession of faith, as we use the Apostles' Creed, we cannot just know of God. We can't just say that we believe in a God. We must say that we believe in God. The writer of Hebrews says, and without faith it is impossible to please God because if anyone who comes to Him, they must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. You see, faith in God comprises an acknowledgement of God. It's a a faith in that the Scriptures, yes, reveal God to us, but also a grasping at those truths that the Scripture reveals to us. It's understanding and believing and being fully convinced that God is indeed Yahweh as He's revealed Himself in the Bible and it's affirming that Yahweh means that this is His name and this is what He's going to do. That's exactly what Romans 4, if we were to move backwards in the letter to the Romans, Romans 4 talks about our father Abraham and it tells us that he received faith because he first knew God. And because he knew God, he was fully convinced of his promises. That's exactly what our confession is to be. It's to be an intimate, personal relationship that we know God. And that that the name God packs a punch, you might say. 
that it guarantees that He is going to do everything that He said He's going to do in His Word. Every promise that has been made, He is going to fulfill. I think our shorter catechism can best summarize what we acknowledge of God. It says, God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in His being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. That is our God. And that is who He is. And that is what He's going to be. He's going to execute wisdom. He's going to execute power. He's going to execute holiness. He's going to execute justice. He's going to execute goodness. He is going to execute truth. And He's going to do all it, all of it perfectly. And again, I think we could say that even the children could understand this. It's those children's catechism. Is there... Only one true God. Yes, there is only one true God. And how many persons does this true God exist? Three persons. And what are the names of those three persons? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And you say, wait Matt, if we are to acknowledge what the Bible reveals as true about God, do we have to, do we have to say that, that believing in the Trinity is an essential of confessing God. You're absolutely right. The Trinity matters. When we are united to our God as we claim Him as ours and He claims us as His, we are united to a God that is Father, Son, and Spirit. In fact, God executes His providences and His decrees. He executes the the wisdom, the power, the holiness, justice, goodness, and truth that our Shorter Catechism says by acting as a triune God. You think about just our salvation. The Father adopts, the Son atones, the Spirit changes our hearts. It's a Trinitarian matter when we confess that we believe in God. And really, I think that when we, when we confess God, we must understand that faith in God comprises a dependence upon Him. That when we confess with our mouth, that we believe in God, we are, we are declaring that, that yes, He is the God revealed to us in the Bible. Yes, He is Father, Son, and Spirit. And yes, we are utterly dependent upon Him. You know, isn't that exactly what we've been studying the past number of weeks in the Gospel of Mark on Sunday mornings? As we moved out of that second act of the Gospel of Mark into that third this morning in Mark chapter 11, we even mentioned how Mark chapter 8 through Mark chapter 10 is all about Jesus teaching His disciples what a disciple looks like. And repeatedly through those chapters, Jesus uses illustration after illustration after illustration to declare what? That the disciple of Christ, that the disciple of God is dependent upon Him. Is humble in His presence they recognize their neediness and they cry out to Him for mercy and faith. That is the confession of faith, that we believe in God. When we say we believe in God, we're saying we're not God. Isn't that an awesome declaration that we get to make each and every Lord's Day, every time we use the Apostles' Creed? It's just like if we sang every Sunday, and Miss Francis would love us to, by the way, Rock of Ages. When we said, nothing in the, my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Pile I to the fountain fly, wash me Savior or I die. That is, what we, that is how we show or confess our dependence upon Him. Every time we confess together, I believe in God in the Apostles' Creed. Now you might be thinking, Matt, how can I be sure that I believe in the God revealed to me in the Bible? Well, I think here are a couple of marks of how we can make sure that we believe in the God revealed to us in our Bibles. I think the first kind of mark of faith in the biblical God is found in those whom God has acted first. A commentator that I was reading says, Unless God draws near to the soul to enlighten it with the glorious beams of His reconciled countenance, His reconciled face, and to draw it to Himself with cords of His love, it can neither know nor desire nor seek Him. Isn't, what the, isn't this exactly what the Scripture says in 1 John 4? 
that we love God because He first loved us. That if we are going to believe in the biblical God, if we are to confess the biblical God, we must understand that, that it's God who changes our hearts first. And then the second mark, I think, is that we delight in the presence of God. We delight in the presence of God. If we confess that we believe in God, the God of the Bible is Yahweh. If we are to say we're dependent upon Him, that He is God and we are not, then we delight to be in His presence. We delight to be in the presence of, of Him who we love. For Jesus says, where our treasure is, there your heart is also. I love what Augustine says in his confessions. He says, my mind is devoted to thee, inflamed with love to thee, breathing for thee, panting after thee, desiring to see thee and thee alone. Upon thee, therefore, do I call, O most beloved God of all, to thee I cry aloud with my whole heart. I love Augustine's way that he, that he, one, uses very intimate words to speak of his God, but, but also that he desires God. He desires to be in the presence of God. And I think that if we confess the biblical God, we must desire to be in his presence. And I think that, you know, the next mark would be that there's a sorrow in his absence. I was actually speaking to a friend this past week that, that helped me come up with this Mark, because admittedly he's going through kind of a a, a dry and weary season. He he has an office at his home and he says that as he goes upstairs into his office, as he opens his Bible and begins to pray each and every morning, he says it's as if God is completely absent. He says he reads, he prays, and it doesn't seem like God's speaking, it doesn't seem like God is hearing. And I asked him, I said, "Well, well, what are you doing? He said, well, I've used all my prayer time just to cry out to him that he would be near. And so my prayer for him is that tomorrow morning when he walks in his office, he will, he will experience the presence of Jesus. And if it's not tomorrow morning, I pray that it's Tuesday morning uh, and Wednesday morning and so on and so forth. But, but, to, but, to hear him, but to hear him long to be in the presence of Jesus lets me know that he believes in Jesus. That he longs to be in the presence of the Almighty, that he longs to be in the presence of Yahweh, shows me that he confesses with a full heart that he believes in him. And I think the last mark is that there's a pursuit of holiness. There's a pursuit of holiness. Without holiness, the author of Hebrews says, no one will see the Lord. But the good news is that if we do confess that we believe in God, we will desire to live for His glory. We will desire to look more like Him. We will desire to to put to death sin in our life and to pursue Christ's likeness with the sure and steady hope that we will be sanctified. That we will be more and more holy as we strive to be more and more holy. You see, if we confess that we are totally dependent on God, that He is God and we are not, And yet we desire to follow Him. We desire to put to death sin in our life and to pursue holiness and righteousness as He is holy and righteous. He promises us that we will be more and more like Him until we reach eternity. And we will be glorified like Him the rest of our days. I think these are the marks of faith in God. That when we confess that we believe in God, We must examine ourselves to see if we believe in the God revealed to us in the Scriptures. Are we believing and confessing in the God revealed to us in the Scriptures? Well, are we desiring to be holy as He has revealed to us to be holy? Are are we longing to be in His presence? Are we full of joy when we are in His presence? And are we those people who who know that our faith in Him is only a work of the Father, Son, and Spirit? If so, I think we can say very confidently that we believe in God. My prayer is that we all can say that with much confidence in our hearts. Let's pray to that end. Father in heaven, we do thank you for the opportunity to come to your word. 
And we thank you for your word confronting us and convicting us and encouraging us as, as it challenges us to not only confess God with our lips, but to let our confession stream out of our hearts. And so, Father, let us believe in the God of our Bibles. Let us believe in God as he has revealed to us in his word, as he has revealed himself to us in his word. And let us test ourselves and examine ourselves to ensure that we're not like some Sheila, thinking that God is just simply some moral teacher. Or that we're not like many and many and many within our culture that just simply believes in something and we just happen to call him God. But let us believe in the God of the Old and New Testaments. Let us confess him with our lips. Let us hold him dear within our hearts. And let it change us. Make us more holy. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. It's good for us to sing in response to God's Word. If you'll take out those hymn books and let's open up to hymn number 565. Uh, Let's sing that hymn, All for Jesus. Let's stand as you are able. People of God, receive the blessings of God. Now may the Lord of peace Himself give you peace at all times and in every way. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.